In this video, I will write a proof for the limit law for sums of functions. In the previous video, I already explained the statement of all the limit laws and why we care about them. I will add a link in the description. Here is the theorem I want to prove. If the limit of a function f is L and the limit of a function g is m at the same point a, then their sum f plus g also has a limit and the limit is L plus m. For this to be a precisely written statement, I need to introduce all my variables. So before I said this, I should have said that a, l, and m are real numbers, and f and g are functions. And so that I can talk about their limits as x approaches a, I would require that f and g be functions defined at least on an interval centered at a, except maybe at a. And now this is a precisely written statement. For convenience, throughout the proof, I'm going to refer to the sum of f and g as h, this is only so that I can write h of x instead of f of x plus g of x when I need it. I'm going to begin by focusing on the conclusion, on the then part. The then part is what I want to prove. So I probably will have to use the definition of this part of what I want to prove. So let's recall the definition of limit. This is what I want to show. I want to show that for every epsilon positive, there exists a delta positive such that if the distance between x and a is between 0 and delta, then the distance between h of x and l plus m is less than epsilon. And since this is what I want to prove, I know what the structure of my proof should look like. It should correspond to this statement. So I will begin my proof by fixing an arbitrary value of epsilon positive, and then, possibly with some effort, I will have to say what I take as delta, then I will fix a real number x and assume the if power, that the distance between x and a is between 0 and delta. And after doing some math, hopefully I will conclude that the distance between h of x and l plus m is less than epsilon. I went quickly through this because this should be familiar. It is exactly the same structure as other easier epsilon delta proofs I have written in the past. And in those cases, I went slower. So if this is not familiar for you, I suggest you post and watch those videos first. I will put a link in the description. Before going any farther, I want to address a point that I know is confusing for some students. In this proof, I will be using the definition of limit for h on the one hand and for f and g on the other hand, but the way I use it is very different, and here is why. We want to show that the limit of h is l plus m, but we are assuming we already know that the limit of f is l. So, for h, our objective, when we want to show, think about the definition of limit for every epsilon, there exists a delta, etc. In my proof, I will need to fix an arbitrary value of epsilon, I can't choose it, and then I will need to show how I find a value of delta that works for it. By contrast, I don't need to prove anything about f. I'm assuming I know the limit exists, so think about the definition, for every epsilon there exists a delta. If I want to, I can choose any value of epsilon, and since I know the statement in the definition is true, that means it is guaranteed that there exists a value of delta that works for it. So very different. For h, I don't choose epsilon and I have to say how I produce delta. For f, I can choose any value of epsilon I want and the delta will be given to me. If this is clear, it's going to make the rest of the video much easier to understand. But I'm not ready to write a proof just yet. I still have to do some rough work to figure out what I'm taking as delta. So let's focus on that. I want to end up concluding that the distance between h of x and l plus m is less than epsilon. First, a little bit of algebra. I can write h of x in terms of f of x and g of x. And I can group the terms on the right as f of x minus l plus g of x minus m. And then say that the absolute value of the sum is less than or equal than the sum of the absolute values. This is just a triangular inequality. I will keep this inequality because I'm going to need it. And here's how it helps me. I want to conclude that the term on the left is less than epsilon. One way to do that is to make each one of the two terms on the right less than epsilon over 2. Can I make the distance between f of x and l less than epsilon over 2? Yes, I can, because I know, I am assuming, that the limit of f of x is l. Once again, this is one of my hypotheses, I'm assuming it and I get to use it. So what I'm going to do is, whatever the value of epsilon is, epsilon is a positive number, I'm going to take that value divided by 2, that's also a positive number, and I'm going to use this as my choice of epsilon, so to speak, in f. In other words, I'm going to plug this in, in the definition of the limit of f of x is l, and I know it's guaranteed that there exists a delta positive, such that if the distance between x and a is between 0 and delta, then the distance between f of x and l is less than epsilon over 2. 
great. But careful, this is not the value of delta I need. And here is why. I'm going to do this for f, and then I'm going to do this for g. And every time I do it, I know there exists a number delta, but it doesn't have to be the same in both cases. So I'm going to call delta 1 the number I obtain for f, and delta 2 the number I obtain for g. So if I do all this, I can conclude there exists a positive number delta 1 that makes the distance between f of x and l be smaller than epsilon over 2. And similarly, a positive number delta 2 that makes the distance between g of x and m less than epsilon over 2. And then what do I take as delta? Well, let's take the smallest of delta 1 and delta 2. The smallest between two positive numbers is still positive. And then if the distance between x and a is less than delta, then it must also be less than delta 1 and less than delta 2. So I get both conclusions. And I think that's it. I think I have a good plan. Of course, I'm not done. I still need to write the proof. Technically, I haven't even started, but at least I have a plan now. Remember, when I write the proof, I should be careful that it follows the right structure and that every step follows logically from the previous ones. Or in other words, when I write the proof, I will verify that it actually works and that I haven't simply confused myself with some circular reasoning doing the rough work. Let's do it. First, I fix an arbitrary positive value of epsilon. Then, I use this number divided by 2 in the definition of the limit of f of x is l. And I conclude that there exists a number, delta 1, such that if the distance between x and a is between 0 and delta 1, then the distance between f of x and l is less than epsilon over 2. I do exactly the same thing in the definition of the limit of g of x is m, and I get a second value that I call delta 2 that works for g. And now that I have delta 1 and delta 2, I'm going to say that I will take delta to be the minimum of both of them. This is also a positive number. Next, if I fix a real number x, and I assume the distance between x and a is between 0 and delta, then I can also conclude it's between 0 and delta 1, and between 0 and delta 2. The first point guarantees that the distance between f of x and l is less than epsilon over 2, and the second point guarantees that the distance between g of x and m is less than epsilon over 2. And now I do some algebra. The distance between h of x and l plus m is, I write h of x in terms of f of x and g of x, and I use the triangular inequality, and I get the sum of two terms, each one being less than epsilon over 2. Epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2 is epsilon. So I have concluded that the distance between h of x and l plus m is less than epsilon, as needed. And this completes the proof. Before I finish, two more comments. First, look at the parts of the proof that I have written in red. The structure of the proof is exactly what I said at the beginning that it should be. And second, notice that all the variables must be introduced carefully in the right order. Before I fix epsilon, it would not make sense to say that I'm choosing epsilon over 2 in the definition of the limit of f. I need to fix epsilon first, then say I'm using epsilon over 2, then that will produce delta 1 and delta 2, and only then I can say what I'm taking as delta. 